taking, we're gonna shift gears and head over to mainland. So I am gonna show you how to construct a one sample T confidence interval for mu. So take note that we have a different letter here. Uh, we're gonna do a T critical value. And we're not doing proportions anymore, right? This symbol is different. This parameter is no longer P for the population proportion, but it's mu for the population mean. And to remind you of where we've come from, from chapter seven, when we talked about means, all right, if you remember from chapter seven, we realized that averages are normally distributed, right? The center is the same as the population distribution and the standard error has this formula, right? We knew that as sample size increased, that standard error decreased. And what I really wanna remind us about is normality in mean land. So remember that in chapter seven, there were two ways, right? There were two ways to get normality. One or the other had to happen. We're gonna pick up a third way in chapter eight, all right? And we're not gonna do that until the second example, but I want you to hear it. We're gonna tack on one more version to this or one more option. So just remember that in mean land, either the population distribution was stated as normal or approximately normal, or this sample size was large enough for the CLT to kick in. And that was that the sample size was at least 30, right? Greater than or equal to 30. So we're gonna take those two and build upon it. So for any confidence interval you give me, you start with your assumptions, right? So you see that the average, your sample mean, is from a random sample, or the sample represents your population, right? Same idea as when we were doing Z confidence intervals for proportions. Now this is the deal breaker, right? This is normality. This is, gets us on the T distribution. So let me write deal breaker. If this assumption is not met, you can't do the confidence interval. All right, so the population distribution is stated to be normal, or the sample size is at least 30, or, and here's the new one, the graph of the data shows plausible normality. And there's a little double asterisk, or doubles, yeah, asterisk here. I'll, I'm gonna circle back to that, okay? So I wanna talk a little bit more about this graph in relation to why we're doing something called a T confidence interval and not something called a Z confidence interval. All right, and then this third one, it might sound silly, but I need you to tell me what the sample standard deviation is. All right, and again, I'm gonna talk about why this third one is here once we address this little, um, this double asterisk here, okay? So the general formula for a confidence interval for a population mean is your statistic, which now is X bar, right? no longer P prime. And then here's your margin of error. So let me circle that, right? That is our margin of error. It's all the stuff after the plus or minus. All right, so it has a critical value called a T star critical value this time. And we've got S over square root N, okay? And here's, I'm gonna to start to peel this apart. If you know S, you put the standard, or the sample standard deviation in this formula. If you knew sigma, all right? And we knew sigma back in chapter seven. And if you're not remembering what sigma is, this is the population standard deviation. So if you know sigma, you put sigma in, all right? But if you only know S, if you only know the sample standard deviation, and you only have the statistic, not the parameter, then put the statistic here. And the deal is when you know S, right, when we're a little bit less clear about what's going on with the population, because we only have data from the sample, we use S and we use a T star critical value. If you had known sigma, right, if for some reason you knew sigma, you would go back and still use the Z star critical value here. So I don't want you to think that you can't use a Z star critical value. It's just most of the time in the real world, we only know the sample standard deviation. So because we're a little less accurate, we're gonna use something called a T star critical value. And I'll try and hopefully relate all of this once we talk about the T distribution down here. Okay, so if you know S, put the S here, use a T star. If for some reason you ever knew sigma, right? If the population standard deviation was known, if sigma was known, put sigma here and use a Z star. All right. We're gonna talk about how to find this critical value and I'm gonna introduce something called degrees of freedom, which I will talk about a little later, okay? All right. For right now though, I do, I should have mentioned this, make sure you understand that the degrees of freedom formula is sample size minus one. So if I had 10 people in my sample, I have nine degrees of freedom. If I have 22 people in my sample, I have 21 degrees of freedom. All right, so I'm gonna try and make this all gel. I know it's a lot to take in the T distribution uh, since it's new, but let's look at important properties of the T distributions 
and we'll see if we can get this to gel just a little bit more. All right, so notice that they're plural, okay? When I talk about the Z distribution, there's only the one, only one graph, all right? The T distributions, plural, there are infinite numbers of these, all right? Now they have properties that we're gonna talk about, and they look a lot like the Z distribution, but they are different. They're a little less, they're a little bit more spread out, we'll say it that way. So the T curve, the T graph, the T distribution corresponding to any fixed number of degrees is bell-shaped and is centered at zero, just like the standard normal curve, all right? So T curves, at least shape-wise, look a lot like Z curves, and you can see that here. They still look like a bell curve, okay? Each T curve is more spread out than the Z curve. So when I say more spread out, they have higher tails. And I know it's hard to read through this because this this, if you look um, in a book or in the, the PDF, that, well actually not even in the PDF, excuse me, where I originally copied this graph, um, this was a, a color graph. So there were different um, colorings to it so you could see the three curves distinctly. But let me talk about what's happening here so I can talk about why the T curve is more spread out. So if we look in the center here around zero, the highest peak goes with the Z curve. The next highest peak, so you see highest, middle, lowest. The middle peak goes with 12 degrees of freedom. Okay, it's a T curve with 12 degrees of freedom. The lowest peak, the lowest peak is the T curve with four degrees of freedom. Okay, now let me make sure I show you where they are on the tail end, right? So here's the middle, here's the tails. All right, so the highest tail is when you have the T curve for four degrees of freedom, okay? The middle tail is when you have the T-curve for 12 degrees of freedom. And the, the one that's got the smallest tail or the lowest tail is the Z-curve. So to try and relate property two to this graph, all right, T-curves are more spread out. Imagine you were on this Z-curve Right, you were on the bottom two here and you lifted the tails up a little bit and started spreading them out. If you lift the tails up and spread them out, you can feel that the peak has got to come down, right? Because you're stretching that curve horizontally so the peak comes down, okay? So each T curve is more spread out than a Z curve, meaning they have higher tails, higher, longer tails. Still symmetric, but their tails are a little bit higher, a little bit longer, more spread out. They have more variability, okay? Okay. As the number of degrees of freedom increases, the spread of the corresponding T-curve decreases. So, for each additional degree of freedom, and I will talk about degrees of freedom, but it, it's related to sample size. So basically, as your sample size increases, these tails get smaller, or I should say shorter and shorter and shorter, right? They, they, they curve down because the variability decreases. So as you add more folks to your experiment, right? More folks to your sample, as your sample size increases, your variability will decrease, meaning your tails get shorter and shorter and shorter. And when the tails get shorter, the peaks are also gonna get higher. And that has to do with number four. As the number of degrees of freedom increase, the corresponding sequence of T curves approach the Z curves. So as degrees of freedom increase, the tails, they stop being this tall, they get really, really close to that Z tail. And the peak here, I know we started at the bottom, but it will head up towards the Z curve, okay? So T curves look a lot like Z curves. They're just, they're more spread out. That's basically it, they have more variability. So let me start to read this, and then I will circle back to this, this double asterisk symbol down here. Or actually, well, let's, let's just talk about it right now. So let me get this in view, okay? So it says, as n gets larger, the t star critical values get closer to the z star critical values. And I, I wrote, you can see this in any vertical column on the critical value table. I'm gonna get to that, okay? Actually, let's just do it now. I keep saying I'm gonna get to things. Let's just get to things. All right. So here's how this is gonna work, okay? If you remember, our Z star critical values were on this bottom row, all 
All right. The T star critical values are everywhere in here. Every other number in here is a T star critical value. Okay. And if you look on any column, okay. Actually, let's start with this leftmost column because that's where the degrees of freedom are. Okay. You can see as degrees of freedom go from one to two to three to 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, as your degrees of freedom increase, I think you can see that the critical value letters get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they get closer to your Z star critical value. Just look along all those columns, right? Let's start with our industry standard of 95%. You can see with one degree of freedom, my T star critical value is 12.71. But as my sample size increases and my degrees of freedom increase, right, I'm up to, once we get down here, we have, geez, 100 degrees of freedom. You can see my critical value letter went from 12 down to 1.984. And it gets closer and closer to the Z star critical value. Now I'm going to come back to this. Just wanted to give you an idea of what that sentence here was um, trying to talk about. So as N gets larger, the T star critical values get closer to the Z star critical values, right? So the tails are coming down and the peaks are heading up. The larger your sample, the more but robust your inference procedure, the more likely skewness will not affect plausible normality. That's because of the central limit theorem. For smaller samples, we need our graphs to be roughly symmetric with no outliers. As n gets larger, we will allow some wiggle room for skewness. As n approaches 30, we know the sampling distribution approaches normality. Many statisticians will actually use a Z star critical value when estimating means where the sample size is larger than 30. We will use this concept when we take a look at margin of error for means. I know this is a lot to take in, but what I'm trying to say here, let me go back to this. All right, so we got it all in view. Here are the rules and stats. If you only know S, you should use a T star critical value. All right, that's, that's the rule. All right, if you only know the sample standard deviation, we use the T star. If you ever know sigma, if you know the population, you can use a Z star. But some statisticians, and I actually don't subscribe to this, it's not something I believe in. Well, it's not something I, I believe in, it's just something I don't practice. Some folks believe if n is 30 or higher, that you could just put the Z star here and use that number at the bottom row. All right, they think, well, the central limit theorem's kicked in, I'm good to go. I still like to err on the side of precaution. T stars, those numbers are a little bit bigger than Z stars. They give us a little bit larger margin of error. And I just like being a little bit more safe. I'm not as risky in life and in statistics. All right, I know that's a lot to take in. Let's play this out in an actual example. Okay, gang, we're gonna look at our first confidence interval in mean land. And it's great that we know it's in mean land because it just came after my spiel about the T distribution. But let's just also be on the listen and on the lookout for clues that tell us we are in mean land. So here we go. Based on a sample of workers at Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant, the Diablo's Unit 2 reactor was rated the 28th worst in the country. They reported a mean annual radiation exposure of 0.481 rems for a random sample of 31 Unit 2 workers. Let mu denote the true mean radiation exposure for Unit 2 workers at Diablo Canyon Assume the sample standard deviation is 0.35 rems. Construct a 95% confidence for a confidence interval from you and interpret this interval. All right, there are a bunch of clues that are telling us we're in mainland. So let's take a look at the first one that I notice. I notice the word mean. All right, that is a great clue. The other thing I noticed is this, these units here. So if you look at this number 0.481, it could in theory be a proportion, right? That could have been 48.1%, but you see units, right? 0.481 rems, and rem is a, uh, it's the unit we use for radiation exposure. Like if you do x-rays or you have gamma rays, I believe it's something like rotengen in man or equivalent to man. I forget um, the science and how they would define it. But this is this is the units for radiation exposure. And just in general, radiation exposure is a bad thing. You don't want that. So because I had units, all right, that's another reason I know I have a numerical variable. It's a num numerical variable. Numerical variables have units, right? Categorical variables, their units are percentages or proportions. I also see the symbol mu, okay? I see another word for mean or another word of mean. See the mu again, right? I see the units again. So all of those are great clues that we are in mean land, okay? 
So I'm going to put this over here that we are in mean land. And that means we're going to use a T star critical value. All right. Now, I mentioned this before, that it is possible to use the Z star critical value. The reason being our sample size, you see we have 31 folks. So there are some folks in stats who say, well, you have at least 30 people in your sample. So I could use the Z star critical value instead of the T star. And if I was going to use Z star for 95%, we'd go 1.96. And that's all fine and good, but I just want you to be hearing that we are always going to use T star critical values in mean land. The only time we won't is when we do the margin of error problems, and that's just to make the problems a little bit simpler. So we're going to use a T star critical value. All right, and in order to use the T star critical value, I'm going to have to teach us how to use that gigantic table. All right. Now, I still only have the one sample. I'm running this experiment once. So there are my notes. OK, great. So with that, let's see what we got to do to run this, this, or to, excuse me, to construct this confidence interval. So if you remember from your proportion days when we were doing it, the first thing we want to do is start with assumptions. All right, now our assumptions were on the previous page. So let's take a look at them. All right. So I need that my sample was either random or represented the population. So let's see what we got here. All right, so I will start with assumptions. And let's breeze through this. All right, do we have a random sample? Yes, I did. So I will put random sample with a check mark by it. Okay, now let's see if we can say we're on the normal or approximately normal sampling distribution. All right, so normality in mean land. The two ways that we talked about in chapter seven was that the problem stated the population distribution was normal, or the sample size was 30 or higher and the CLT kicked in. We're gonna talk about the graph that shows plausible normality in the next example. So I'm gonna come back to this third option, this new option we pick up in chapter eight, um, basically, what do you do when you have a small sample? We'll talk about that in the next example. But for right now, you see we get normality because our sample size is 31, which is greater than or equal to 30. Okay. That is my deal breaker assumption. So I'm, I'm good to go. All right. Now, the third assumption is that you know the sample standard deviation. All right. And I said this sounds silly before, like how is that an assumption? It's an assumption because when you know S, you know you use the T star critical value. When you know sigma, if you ever for some reason actually knew the parameter, the population standard deviation, you could put the Z star here. Okay? It's just in the real world, you don't know the population standard deviation unless you already know the population mean. And if you already know the population mean, there's no reason to run a confidence interval. So that's why I don't ever use um, Z star critical values here. But like I said, there's a, a whole subpopulation or subset of the stats world that does use it. That's all fine and good. I know the sample standard deviation, so I'm gonna write it down. All right, so my sample standard deviation is 0.35 REMs. Okay, got that. The next thing I wanna do is make my title. So as I do this, again, you want to tell me how many samples you have, what land you're in, and what letter you're using. So samples, land, letter. So I had one sample. This time, I'm in mean land. All right, this time I'm doing a T star confidence interval. Okay, so I have a one sample mean T star confidence interval. All right, the next thing I want to do is actually construct the interval using my formula. Okay. So I'm gonna copy this formula down, right? My statistic plus or minus my margin of error. And every margin of error has a critical value and a standard error. So let me write this down. And we're gonna talk about what numbers we need to plug in. All right, so let's start looking at this. For my average, Right? They told me my sample mean was 0.481. I'm going to plug that in. Okay. I'm going to come back to this. For S, they told me the stand sample standard deviation was 0.35. They also told me the sample size was 31. So I know these three numbers just from the wording of the problem. But I do need to look up my T star critical value. So this is how this works. 
in order to use that giant table, all right, or to go inside that table, you always need to cross your confidence level column with your degree of freedom row, okay? Confidence level column, degree of freedom row. So let's figure out what we're gonna be crossing. I was told to be on the 95% confidence interval column. So that means that my critical value letter, or excuse me, my critical value number, my bad, is somewhere in this column. I just need to know how far down I need to go. All right, so for that, I need degrees of freedom. So let's calculate our degrees of freedom. I'm just gonna do it off to the side here. So my degrees of freedom is always sample size minus one. In this case, we had 31 people. If I lose a degree of freedom, that means my degrees of freedom are actually 30. I shouldn't say if I lose a degree of freedom. I lose one off of that sample size and my degrees of freedom are 30. So let's keep this in mind. I have 30 degrees of freedom and I'm going at 95% confidence. So I'm gonna just use my ruler to guide me. So I'm in my 95% column, all right? So I'm here, but now I need to go 30. So let me go to where it says 30 at 95%. If I look there, I can see 2.042. That's the number that is in the 95% confidence column and the 30 degrees of freedom row, 2.042. So let's write that down. All right, so here we go. This means I'm gonna go 0.481 plus or minus 2.042. My sample standard deviation was 0.35, right? And then my sample size was 31. So this is me beginning to construct that confidence interval. So let's go figure out what our margin of error is equal to. All right, so let me clear all of this out from our proportion days. We have what, 2.042 no, times 0.35. I'm gonna divide that by the square root of 31. So it looks like my margin of error is about 0.128 rems. So I have 0 0.481 plus or minus 0 0.128. So let's see what numbers we are working with here. So we've got 0.481 plus 0.128. I have about 0.609 up top. And then let me repeat that, but change this to the subtraction sign. And it looks like I have about 0.353. Okay, so that means my confidence interval goes from 0.353 as the lower bound to 0.609. Now, I'm not, a, like, I'm not a scientist, obviously, so I don't know if this is a lot of radiation exposure or a little. I don't think any radiation exposure is good, but we think that the parameter, right, the true average, not just from the random sample of 31 workers, but from all of the 31, I'm sorry, all of the unit two workers, I think the average exposure is somewhere between 0.353 rems and 0.609 rems. All right. So this is all fine and good. I have three components to this, this confidence interval, but I do want to interpret it. So let's talk about how do you interpret a confidence interval when you are in mean land. And to help us do that, we just need to look a little bit past this page. All right, and I have the templates on the next page. So I'm just gonna push the next page over so that we can see those templates. They're very similar to the proportion templates, right? We are blank percent confident that mu the true mean, whatever your variable is, is between the lower limit with some units and the upper bound or the upper limit of your confidence interval with some units. So for us, if I was gonna try and play this out for the example that we're looking at right now, we would be 95% confident that mu, right, the true mean radiation exposure for unit two workers at Diablo Canyon is between, and I'll remind myself with my calculator, is between 0.353 rems and 0.609 rems. So I'm gonna write that sentence out. So as I'm going through this, right, we are 95% confident that mu, the true mean, and I'll just use the words written here, the true mean radiation exposure. 
Can you see what I'm writing? Yeah. is between and we had a lower bound of 0 0.35 rems and 0 0.609 rems okay so there I am interpreting my interval now just for fun I, I know I didn't ask you to do this but just for fun let's interpret the level as well since this is our first time doing a mean problem together um, so let me say this was interpreting the interval. And let's interpret the level in just a moment. All right, so let me move this up. There we go. So now let me interpret the level. And I have the template for that as well. Okay, so if we take a look at this, very similar to proportion land, right? So we used a method to construct the estimate, again, the estimate, right? Confidence interval estimate. So we're guessing what our parameter is and that in the long run, we'll successfully capture mu. I think our level was, yeah, 95% of the time. We were using industry standard. Okay. Okay, now even though this is our template and it will always work, I wanna give you just a different way of writing it up just so you hear it. Because what we're really trying to say is if I've repeated this experiment, right? If this whole procedure was repeated multiple times, so I found another random sample of workers created a confidence interval. Found another random sample of workers created a confidence interval. And I created interval after interval after interval. Imagine you had, like I said, 100 of these then about 95% of them are good and about 5% are bad. And when I say good versus bad, about 95% of them have the parameter in there. Like we, we got a good estimate. And about 5% of the time you mess up. So here's just an alternate way of writing this up. And I mentioned this so that we're aware of this, this phrasing. So if this procedure were repeated many times Ninety-five percent of the confidence intervals that were constructed all right would contain mu. And that's, that's all we want. We want to estimate what this number is. So 95% of the time, my parameter's in that interval, and 5% of the time, I mess up. Okay. Now, I'm gonna scooch this up. I also wanna just give us a, a graphical take on, on what all of this means. So let me move this up. And let's see what I can get in view. I'll keep that down there. Now give me a moment to find my ruler. I seem to have misplaced it. Huh, I wonder where I put that thing. Well, let me grab another one. Okay. 
So when I say a graphical representation, I, again, I want you to see what this would look like on the sampling distributions that we talked about back in chapter seven. So if I had an x-axis, right, and here's, actually it's not even an x-axis, it's an x-bar this time, right? It went from 0.353 to, what was our high, 0.609. Oops. All right, and I've asked this a couple times, but what number smack dab in the middle? Well, what's halfway between 0.353 and 0.609? Let's find out. 0.353 plus 0.609. If I divide that by two, what do you know? Our statistic, our sample mean is right in the middle, and it should be. That's how we created this confidence interval. So right here in the middle is 0.481. And we knew that our margin of error here, right? We had a margin of error of 0.128, right? And we had a margin of error here of also 0.128, technically 0.128 rems, right? This is all average radiation. All right, so here was our other place we could see the margin of error of 0.128 rems. Yeah, oops, gosh. That was not what I wanted, there we go. Okay, because if I wanted to label my x-axis, right, this is average radiation exposure. That's my variable here. In REMS. But I, I just want to remind you of where you can find all these numbers or where you can see them graphically, right? We always build our sampling distribution around that statistic. All right, and then we knew that 95% of our observations are gonna fall within that mean. So here is our, it's not my best graph, this is our 95% confidence interval. Middle 95% here. Okay, there we go. So yeah, I just wanted us to take a look at that so that we, we could have that visual. All right, so I'm gonna hit the pause button for a moment and then I'm gonna flip over to my calculator so that you can see how we could get all of this with our calculator and then I'll meet you back and we'll, we'll fill in all the stuff off our calculator. We'll do it one more time and then we're gonna just adjust some few, uh, a few, um, few conditions as we move through the rest of this example. All right, I'll catch you in a bit, bye. Hey, Math 43, let's take a look at how we can do this problem on our calculators. And again, I'm gonna want all of the write-ups in here. You see like the whole shenanigans, that's still gonna happen, but at least your calculator can help you with finding those two numbers, your lower bound of your confidence interval and the upper bound. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna hit stat and we're gonna go over to tests. Now we've been in this drop down menu before, we did it for proportions, that was stat test A. All right, now wherever you see the word test, just put a pin in that, we're gonna come to that in chapters nine, 10, 11, all of that stuff. But we wanna do confidence intervals or interval estimates. Give us a moment to catch up. And those start from uh, menu item seven through menu item B. Again, we had A in here for the last one. So when you're in proportion land, for whatever reason, your calculator will write the word prop in there. And so what we have to glean is when prop isn't written, all these first four must be in mean land. So I wish they were out the word mean in there, but they don't. Okay, so I know that if I have no word written, if prop isn't written there, I'm in mean land. So I could either for this problem choose seven, eight, nine, or zero. So how we can rule a couple of those out is we only had one sample for, for this problem. We only ran this survey once or this experiment once for those unit two workers over at um, the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. So the other thing that we have to infer is when they don't have the word or the number two here, if you see there's numbers missing on options seven and eight, that must be the options for single sample. Okay, so now I've narrowed it down to either seven or eight. Now, I will always have us use T intervals when we're in mean land. The only time we'll ever deal with a Z interval in mean land is when we have those margin of error problems. 
but when we're constructing intervals, it'll be a T interval. And I've mentioned a couple of times, but it's, it's never bad to repeat myself, that some stats folks, because this sample size is over 30, they'll just run the Z interval. They're like, ah, I know I'm on the sampling distribution and it's approximately normal because of the CLT. And they go do that and they get a little bit tighter of an interval. It's a little bit um, narrower and that's fine. I just think that since we're not dealing with uh, any information on the population, I don't know the population standard deviation, sample size is just 31. Um, I want a little bit wider uh, interval. I need a little bit more wiggle room, a little bit more margin of error. So I always err on the side of caution which is why we run T intervals in here. Okay, so let's go to eight. All right, so you have these two options. Do you have the raw data or do you have the summary statistics? That's the first decision you have to make. And we have summary statistics, All right? So I'm gonna go activate this or make that one active. And if you're thinking, well, how, how would I know that? I didn't give you 31 data values that you have to put into a list. We just have the summary stats. I know the sample mean was 481. I know the um, standard deviation was 35, right? I, I don't have everyone's individual data value. All right, so then here they're going to ask you, what was the sample mean? And it looks like the average radiation exposure was 0 0.481 rems. All right, the sample standard deviation was point, what was it, 35 rems. And then our sample size here was 31. And we were at the industry standard of 95%. So if I scroll down here and I hit enter, you're going to see there it is 0.353 and 0.609. And it's just nice in that you can jump from this step where you've plugged in your numbers for your particular problem. And instead of crunching the margin of error all on your own, you can just jump to the lower and upper bound um, numbers. That's fine. Okay. Now I just want to give you a for example. Let's say you run into a teacher that is fine with you running a Z interval. Let me show you what that would look like. Okay, let me clear my key press history. I would still do the same thing. I go to stat tests, but now I'm going to actually do option seven. Okay, now I have summary stats and in place of S, right? let's say you really did know the population standard deviation. Here's where you would plug in 0.35, right? Our, Average was 0.481, 31. So it's pretty much the same input, just in a slightly different order. And when I hit enter, I'm looking at 0.358 to 0.604. So you can see it's a little bit narrower because again, the T distribution, they have the like higher tails, right? And the lower peak, they're a little bit more spread out. There's a little bit more variability in there. If you ever make it to the standard normal distribution, things are a little bit tighter. All right, that's why we have a smaller confidence interval, at least in terms of its width. All right, but I'm always going to err on the side of caution and use a T interval. And so I'm going to instruct you to do that as well. All right, thanks, gang. I'll see you. Bye. Okay, gang, so we just saw how to do that on our calculator, and I, I just want to review it here. And then I want to show you a kind of convoluted way to get that um, critical value of 2.042. I'm not saying you want to do it this way, but it's still fun to, well, I think fun to talk about. So let me show you what I mean. Let's just review up what we did on our calculator. And even though you need the whole write-up for your free response questions, it's still nice to have your calculator crunch some numbers for you. So if we go over to stat test, now again, hypothesis test won't come into play until chapter nine. So let's go down to um, option eight. We're gonna do the T interval here. I do not have raw data. We will have that in the next example. I had summary statistics. So we had 0.481 here. 0.35, we had 31 folks, and we were going at 95% confidence. So you see that confidence interval, there it is, 0.353 and 0.609, okay? Now, we were able to get that critical value number of 2.042 from our table, right? And if you remember where we were getting 2.042, we were going up 95% confidence with 30 degrees of freedom, all right? So I'm gonna show you how you can get this off of your calculator. And the reason I'm showing you is because there will be times when you're asked to find a confidence interval and the numbers aren't provided. You know, like maybe I ask you for a 92% confidence interval or a 94 and you don't have that column. So this is how we can work around it. Now, we said this, we've said this throughout the entire semester, your calculator is built in percentiles. 
And the problem is these confidence intervals, they're middles, right? So back when we were even doing the empirical rule, right? The middle 68, the middle 95, the middle 99.7. Middles are one thing, but we've got to convert these to percentiles. So go with me for a moment. And this is how I can find the T star critical value, okay? If this is the middle 95%, that means there is 2.5% here and 2.5% here. All right, in terms of area under the curve, because the entire bell curve has to be 100%. So if this is the middle 95, there's 2.5% here, 2.5% here. Now we talked about this in chapter six, that this was the 2.5th percentile, right? Because 2.5% of the area under the curve was from here on down. Now, if you add 95% to that, right, the percentile you're rocking here is 97.5. All right, so this is the 97.5th percentile. So if you wanted to find that number of 2.042, if you knew the percentile, instead of inverse norm, you could do inverse T. All right, so we did inverse norm in chapter six. We're now on the T distribution, so we're gonna do inverse T. And instead of putting in your percentile and then zero, one, because the standard normal had a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, we would put in our percentile. And then all your calculator needs is the degrees of freedom. Okay. So if I was going to do this, right, let me go crunch this out. I'll do second vars. All right. So if you remember from chapter six, we use normal CDF and um, inverse norm. I want us to use the next one down. We're going to go to inverse T. And if you put in 0.975, comma, your degrees of freedom, what number pops out? And it takes it a little while, but you can see there's 2.042, okay? So I'm gonna practice this idea uh, just for a bit so we can see this um, playing itself out in the next few examples. All right, so if I'm going through this, let me scooch this up. I wanna to start to change some parameters or just some of the conditions here so we can see how certain variables are affected when numbers change. So here's what I mean by that. We're gonna now construct a 95% confidence interval, but I'm gonna bump up the sample size from 50, excuse me, from 31 to 50. And let's play this out on our calculators for the most part. I don't need us going through all of it um, the longer way. So let me go stat tests. I'm gonna do option eight. All right, so what I wanna adjust here is I wanna keep everything the same, except I want the 50 to go, okay? And I want you to think before I hit enter, do you think I'm gonna have a wider interval or a narrow interval? What happens when I increase my sample size? Does my interval get wider or does it get narrower? Let's see what happens if I crunch this. All right, what do we have happening here? All right, it looks like it's 0.382 to 0 0.580. So let me write that down. Okay, all right. Now let me do it for n equaling 100, and then let's talk about what we're noticing. So let me change this out to 100. And what do we see here? Wait for it. Looks like we've got 0.412 to 0.550. All right, so with that, let me rewrite it up here so it's in view. Our original confidence interval when n was 31 we had 0.353 to 0.609, right? This is when our margin of error was 0.128 rems. All right, let's figure out what our margins of error were here. So when I bumped up the sample size, what did my margin of error turn into? Well, we've mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. What number is right in the middle of this confidence interval? 0.481, it always says. So if I wanted to look at my margin of error, you can take your upper, uh, upper bound of your confidence interval and subtract out that center of 0.481. It looks like my margin of error now is 0 0.099. All right. And I can get that by taking the upper bound and subtracting out my mean, or I can take my mean of 0.481, my sample mean, and subtract out my lower bound, and I still get 0.099. So there's my margin of error. All right, let's see what was happening here. So I will take my upper bound of 0.550 and subtract out my mean of 0.481. 
So here it looks like my margin of error is 0.069 rems. So I think you can see that as I increase sample size from 31 to 50 to 100, my margin of error decreased, right? As sample size increased, variability decreased. So let me take note of that here. As sample size increased, margin of error decreased, right? which I hope makes some sense. If you want to be more accurate, you got to survey more people. If you wanted to figure out the exact numbers, like how did I get 0.099, we could go construct the margin of error. We would just need different critical values. And I talked up here about how you could find those critical values on your calculator. So I could run the same thing. I could say, hey, let me do inverse T. I still need the 97.5th percentile, but now I have 50 degrees of freedom, or actually I have N equaling 50. Um, I have 49 degrees of freedom. Oh, uh, and as I say that, I should write that I have 49 degrees of freedom. So wait for my critical value letter is that much smaller. It's 2.01 instead of 2.042. Right? If I wanted to find my critical value letter here, if you have 100 folks, you have 99 degrees of freedom. All right? And you can see your T-star critical value, it's 1.984. Right? It's getting really, really close to that Z-star critical value of 1.96. Now, if you wanted to do this on the table, which is fine, all right, let me just make mention of this here. When you have n equaling 50, you have 49 degrees of freedom. Right? When you have n equaling 100, you have 99 degrees of freedom. So let's talk about what we would need to do on our calculators, and on our calculators, on the tables to get this to work. So I would be at 95% confident, right? and I need to go to 49 degrees of freedom. So here's where the calculator, or not the calculator, where the table isn't as good as the calculator. So I'm 95 degrees, or 95% confidence, and I need 49 degrees of freedom. So how this works is we go conservative. 49 is trapped between 40 and 50. You can see on the degrees of freedom rows, they jump between 40 and 50. So here's what you do. You don't have 50 degrees of freedom. I get that you're pretty close, but you haven't achieved that much accuracy yet. So we go conservative, and we would say that the critical value letter, or excuse me, critical value number we were gonna use was 2.021, okay? Now, you can see that if we were doing it on our calculator, it's actually much closer to the 50 degree number, right? The 2.009 that's listed here, but it's just a little bit larger because we don't quite have 50 degrees of freedom. We only have 49. So when you're using the table, you go conservative. You go to the smaller number. And that would be the similar case here for when I had 99 degrees of freedom. I didn't quite hit 100, so I can't put 1.984. I'll go a little bit conservative. I'll do 1.990 because I've definitely achieved 80 degrees of freedom. And again, you can see the 1.984 is actually a closer estimate, right? I'm just off by two, gosh, 10 thousandths. But when you're using the table, you go conservative. So that's why I actually prefer using my calculator because it gives me a more accurate answer. The table, I mean, it's great, but it has some flaws because they start jumping. They don't have every column or every row listed out. And they also don't have every confidence level listed out. So the table's got some limitations. All right, so let's go run this, but now I wanna change the confidence interval level. I wanna go from, we had 95, right? let me put this was 95% confident. All right, now let's go 98 and then go 99. See if we can figure out what's happening here. All right, so let's go back into this. Option eight. I'm gonna change this back to 31. So let's keep the sample size um, as we originally had it. And let's go, what was the first number? We're going up to 98. All right, so now if I hit calculate, it looks like I have about 0.327 and 0.635. And let me go 99 now. So now I am at 0.308 to 0.654, okay. All right, let's see what happened with our margins of error. So again, 0.481 is smack dab in the middle of this one. So let's do 0.635. Minus 0.481, it looks like I had a margin of error about 0.4 or 154 rems. Okay, 
here. It looks like my upper bound was 0.654. Let me subtract out 0.481. Now we're up to 0.173 rems for my margin of error. Okay. So let's see if we can figure this out, right? So I went from a margin of error of 0.128, then to 0.154, then to 0.173. So here you can see as confidence increases, right? Instead of just being 95% confident, if I want to be 98 or even 99, I have to increase my margin of error, right? My intervals got wider. All right, so we're increasing sample size, decrease my margin of error. Increasing confidence level increases my margin of error. So here, as confidence level increases, margin of error also increases. You get a little less accurate. So there's this balancing act that anyone needs to do. You gotta figure out, well, if I want my margin of error, ideally you want your margin of error to be really, really small and you want your confidence level to be super high. But it's a trade-off, right? If you want your margin of error to be small, you gotta increase your sample size, which is gonna take more time and money. If you want your confidence level to be high, uh, or if you want your confidence level higher, then your margin of error goes up, right? Now, how do you combat this? You add more people to your experiment. So it's just, it's always this like push-pull, this yin-yang happening. All right, but one thing I do wanna point out so we can see this in the, the chart, is you can see this phenomenon when you look at the rows or the columns, if you look at a fixed row and a fixed column. So here's what I mean. Let's take a look at what happens to critical values as sample size increases. And I'll stay on the 95% since that's the industry standard. I mentioned this before, but it, it's good to look at it again. So if sample size increases, let's go on the 95%, that means de degrees of freedom is increasing. And you can see your critical value letter is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? It's getting close to the Z star critical value. So since your critical value gets smaller and smaller and smaller, that's gonna decrease your margin of error because your critical value is a part of that formula. It's in the margin of error formula, right? So you can see a sample size increases as we go vertically through this table, all of the numbers get smaller. And on the flip of that, if you move left to right, and you can see when you move left to right, confidence level increases, you can see all of the numbers get larger and larger and larger. So that's why you can see as sample size increases or as degrees of freedom increase, your confidence interval gets narrower. As confidence level increases, your confidence intervals get wider. Okay, so there's always this push-pull. All right, so with that, we're gonna try an example where, where we actually um, look at some raw data. I'll see you in a bit, bye. Hey, Math 43 I just wanna clear up or kind of dig deeper into a couple of concepts that have popped up in, in this last example with taking a look at this new T distribution and this degrees of freedom thing. So I wanna, I'm first gonna look at degrees of freedom. Just gonna give you a little bit more context as to what that is. Why is it N minus one? And then I wanna go back to um, finding T star critical values on your calculator and why your calculator is a little bit stronger than um, your, your table. Although the table's fine, but the calculator's just a, a little bit, it can do a lot more. All right, so here we go. If we look at this, and you can find this, this key up on Canvas. All of these keys are always available to you. It's just my written out notes. So when you hear me say, well, like, what on earth, or you might even be asking, what on earth, are degrees of freedom. So imagine that you love wearing hats and you have seven of them specifically. So you love wearing hats, all right? You don't care so much what a degree of freedom is, but you love wearing hats and you have these seven hats, hats and you wanna wear one each day of the week. All right, so Sunday through Saturday, you wanna pick a hat, right? You wanna have your, your flare on, you're, you're looking good, all of that fun stuff. And these are your seven hats. So you can see they're super fun, okay? Now, on the first day, so you walk into your closet on Sunday, you have seven hats to choose from, right? They're all lined up. You, you, you feel like you could look sharp in any of them. And let's say on Sunday, you choose the lobster hat. You're like, you know, I'm feeling lobstery on this Sunday, so I'm gonna go pick the lobster hat. But I want you to hear you had the freedom to choose that day. So you had freedom um, to pick whatever hat you wanted that day. So you were free to choose, all right? Now that's your Sunday hat. Monday morning rolls around, walk into your closet. Now you have six hats to choose from, 
right? I can choose any of these six. I'm not going to repeat hats. All right, I can choose any of these six hats. And let's just say, and it ha you're going to pick the witch hat only because it's it's next to the lobster hat, so it's easy for me to highlight. Oops, not that. So I could pick a, the the witch hat, and now I I have five hats left. But but hear me on that. On Sunday, you were free to choose which hat you wanted to pick, or which hat you wanted to wear. And on Monday, you were free to choose whichever hat you wanted to wear of the six remaining, right? So you see me writing here on the first day, you can wear any of the seven hats. On the second day, you can choose, you have freedom to choose you, um, any of the six hats remaining. And then on the third day, right, you roll, roll in, it's Tuesday. Now you can pick this hat here or one of these hats here, right? You've got five to choose from, right? You are free to choose. So that's all fine and good. Imagine you get to Friday, so that's day six, right? So you've picked a hat Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and now you're at Friday. If you picked a hat Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you've picked five hats. And just for the sake of me highlighting this, let's say you picked these five hats. So now you have the freedom to choose one of these two hats. So on Friday, you're going to pick one of these two hats. And let's say you pick the Santa hat, right? You're making that choice that you're free to choose on that Friday. As soon as you make that choice on Friday, your choice for Saturday is automatically made, right? If I pick Santa at this point, then I am automatically going to pick this, this drum major -y military band looking hat over here, right? So you can see me saying this here. After you choose, right, I'll start here. After you choose your hat for day six, you have no choice for the day uh, for the hat that you wear on day seven. You must wear the one remaining hat. So when you get into your closet on Saturday, you don't have a choice. It's already been made for you. You, you figured that out really on Friday. So what we're saying is, yes, there were seven days of the week, but there were only six days of the week that you had the freedom to choose which hat you were going to um, wear. You had six, six days of hat freedom. All right. And that's the idea behind this, this notion of degrees of freedom in, in stats. Um, it's, it's basically a, a very broad term for the number of observations in your data set that are free to vary when we're making guesses about populations. Um, so in terms of free to vary, when I say that, what on earth would that mean? Here's, here's where I'm going with this. Let's, let's do a numerical example because days or hats that you wear on days of the week, well, fine. Um, let, let's bring it back down to numbers. So let's say I instructed you to come up with three numbers whose average um, was 10. I told you, hey, pick any three you want. You can choose. You are free to choose any three numbers, all right? I just, the one constraint I'm putting on you is that they have to average out to 30. That, I'm telling you, that has to happen. So I gave you a couple of examples. I gave you 9, 10, and 11. And if you don't believe they average out to 30, let, let's just check. Oops, not 7. <laughs> let's do 9 plus 10 plus 11. All right, and if I divide that by three, turns out their average is 10. Okay, great. Right, I, I gave you another set, right? Eight, 10, and 12. So let's try this. Oops, not second. Let's do eight plus 10 plus 12. What is their average? Well, if I divide that by three, it would be 10. Great. Okay, but here's, here's the kicker. You're actually not free to choose all three numbers. And here's what I mean by this. Let's say you were thinking in your head five and 10. You were like, well, I definitely wanna pick five and I wanna pick 10. Well, if you choose five and 10, if you choose those two numbers, you actually have no choice in what your third number would be. And here's what I mean by that. You've seen that these, these totals, they have to add up to 30, right? Nine plus 10 plus 11 was 30. Eight plus 10 plus 12 was 30. So if you pick five and 10, and they add up to 15, you know your third number has to be 15 because you have to get that grand sum. Oops, let me delete that. You are over it. You have to get that sum to be 30. So if you've picked five and 10, you don't get to choose that third number. It's got to be the number 15. So once you've made the decision that you're choosing five and 10, you no longer have the option for picking 15. You're forced to pick 15. So you had the freedom to choose five and 10, right? Those numbers were free to vary, but the third number was picked for you, which is why we would say in this data set of three observations, your degrees of freedom 
or two. All right, and and we have degrees of freedom. Um, we've seen it before, believe it or not. You saw it in your uh, the formula for sample standard deviation in chapter two. I know that seems like a long ways, um, or it was a long time ago, but in your sample standard deviation formula, we divided by n minus one when we were um, getting the averages of the deviations or the squares of the deviations, not n, and that has to do with degrees of freedom as well. All right, so that's a little bit about degrees of freedom. The other thing I want to touch on is I want to talk more about why your calculator is just more robust and able to get better numbers than your table, which is not to say I don't love your table. All right, I mean, I, I went to college with tables, so they're awesome, uh, and they get the job done. It's just now that we have this technology, it's, it's, it can go faster and it can get you more numbers. So I want to talk about, um, towards the end of example nine, I had to start to just vary some of the parameters I was giving you. The initial um, variation was we increased sample size, right? We went from 31 um, union to, or unit two workers to 50 workers to 100 workers. And we saw that as my sample size increased, my confidence intervals got narrower and narrower and narrower. And then the, on the last set of problems I gave you, we increased the confidence level, and then you saw my margin of error increased, and my confidence intervals got wider. So I just want to go back to this example where we were doing a 98% confidence interval, 31 folks in our sample, and how did we get that critical value number? So here, if I have 31 folks, right, we had 30 degrees of freedom, so you see me going to my row of 30 and my column of 98. And there's that number, 2.457. And that's great. But I want to show you how you can do this on your calculator as well, especially if I give you an interval that's not 96 or 97 or 98. What if I gave you 97%? We need to know how to get those critical values. Um, most calculators can do this. Uh, I think the TI-83s don't have this calculator function, um, but the TI-84s should. And if you're on a TI-83, no problem. Just use the table to the best of your ability. It's no biggie. All right, but I just want to show you how your calculator can make this a little bit nicer. Um, now, if we want the middle 98% of our data from our sampling distribution, right? I'm on a T distribution with 30 degrees of freedom, okay? Your calculator is not built for middles. It needs percentiles, all right? So if there's the middle 98%, there's 1% on a side. So this is the first percentile, right? Because there is 1% of my data from here on down. And over here, this is the 99th percentile because I have my initial 1% and then I gained another 98%. So the cutoff for the middle 98% is the first and 99th percentiles. All right, so if you want to find this 2.457, we're going to go into our distributions. All right, we used to, or we've done normal CDF and inverse norm. Let's now go down to inverse T. All right, we're going to use inverse T because we are on a T distribution. So what you just, uh, you type into your calculator, the percentile, and then all it needs is the degrees of freedom. If you tell it you have 30 degrees of freedom, it knows how wide those tails should be, um, and it can calculate that number, wait for it, 2.457. It's got it. No sweat. All right. And you can see that would be the number I would put in here for my T-star critical value. And again, it's awesome. We could get it from the table, but I, I like looking at it from the calculator's perspective too. Now, let's say we wanted to do this for 99. All right. You can imagine if you have the middle 99% of your data, there's half a percent on a side, right? 99% in the middle, 1% on the outsides, but it's split because of symmetry. So here, for the middle 99, you're split between the 0.5th and 99.5th percentiles. So if I go back into my inverse T to go middle 99, I need to bump this percentile up, right? Middles are different from percentiles, but I'm still on 30 degrees of freedom. If I hit enter, wait for it, takes a moment, you can see there it is, 2.75. And that's what we would have seen on our table anyways. I mentioned this because when we get to the next example, I am gonna force you to have to use your calculator this way. And for the TI-83s, we're just gonna do the best we can. No sweat there, but I do want people to see this. All right, thanks gang.
Bye.